The text is the gospel reading that was just heard, and uh, you have the sermon notes, which some of you are familiar with these, maybe anybody who was not here before, maybe you're not quite familiar with them. They've been very helpful, uh, I found, and well, before I use them, I sort of think back on, on preaching sermons as like milking with a leaky bucket. And yes, it worked, but by the time you got back to the barn and the cooler, some of the milk had leaked out, where this uh, plugs some of the holes and it gives you something to hang on to and remember and look at again. And sometimes people even share it with people who were not here. But let me ask though, how many of you are crafters or woodworkers or you otherwise make things with your hands? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have already made the perfect project in which there were no glitches or errors? <laughs> I was talking to a man. We were in, in Idaho for a number of years and I had, well, I was, ended up being circuit counselor. They called it circuit counselor then, now it's circuit visitor. All my life it's been circuit counselor, so it's going to be circuit counselor. So anyway, <laughs> but I uh, talked to this man who taught industrial arts, and I was talking about some project I was working on, and I said, you know, I measured and I did everything just right, and there's still errors in it. And he says, there's never been a perfect woodworking project. There are errors in all of them. You know, it's just a matter of trying to disguise them or make sure that people don't see them immediately and so on and so forth. <laughs> There's even a, an error or a glitch in the first sentence. I intended to end it with a, a question mark, but somehow I hit a period and went on. <laughs> and so there you have it, that uh, even there a little glitch developed. But sometimes the more intent you are on canceling out all glitches, somehow they creep in more than it seems like they should. I tell people I'm convinced that I've typed perfect documents and then while I'm sleeping, gremlins come at night and they open those documents and they add errors here and there. But anyway, well, when God created the universe, he looked back on each day's work and he saw that it was good, that it was very good. And so also the last verse of this gospel reading says that the people saw what Jesus did and they said that he does all things well. And you may remember too that when the father looked at Jesus, particularly at his baptism, and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Another way of saying he does all things well. Many of the people, though, who lived at the time of Jesus would not have said that he does all things well. There's a little problem. If you look at the geographical references that are in this, this particular part of the gospel, each one of them is pagan territory. They were not known as, as Jewish centers, but as places where the pagans lived. <clears throat> and as a result, they were pretty much considered unclean places to go. And so, you know, the Jews then looked at what Jesus was doing and thought, if he's really a Jew, if he's really from God even, how can he possibly do these things? How can he associate with sinners and tax collectors? Or in John 4, how can he associate with this woman at the well who's had so many husbands and now she hasn't even bothered to get married. She just moved in with a new one and let that be that. How in the world can he be somebody who's godly and so on when he's doing all those things that way? No good Jew would do that. And yet when the woman in this text in the first story comes, She's not a Jew, she's not of Jewish heritage. And you find something that is so frequent in the Gospels. It gets called out in specific ways in Matthew, maybe more so than Mark, but you see it in Mark also. And that is, those people who don't know from anything, who have no heritage, who have no claim, they're the ones who take God seriously and trust what he says. The ones who have been steeped in it for generations and can point to all the good things that's happened in their family through the years and through the centuries, they're the ones who say, eh, and pay no attention. And so what's up becomes down, what's down becomes up. 
the chosen are rejected and the rejected. So this woman comes and, and she begs Jesus to have the, the demon cast out of her, her daughter. And Jesus says, you know, do you have a ticket? Basically says, what right do you have? And, you know, why should I take what belongs to the children and give it to the dogs? And she says, yes, but even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall off the table. And so basically she's saying, Lord, I know that you can help me and I know that you will help me. And so he did. And without even going to where the girl was, he cast the demon out of her and told her to go that her daughter was well and that all things were, were as they should be. What Jesus is showing there is that he came to save those who are not Jews just as well as those who are Jews. And that's pretty good news for us because most of us cannot count ourselves as having Jewish heritage. We did have a, a woman in one church where I served and she got to looking back in her family history and so on and there was some, some Jewish ancestry. <coughs> Excuse me. What had happened was she had lived in a village, or her ancestors had lived in a village in medieval Europe where people were forced to either become Christians or I think either be put to death or experience some kind of horrendous torture or whatever. And um, she figured out that that included her family. That's what had happened to her family, and that's how she came then to be born into a Christian family. So as far as she was concerned, it worked out pretty well. But uh, it's kind of a horrific thing when you think about uh, how it worked and so on. It's probably a lot better to preach the gospel to them than it is to hold a sword to their throat uh, in the end. But anyway, it, it turned out that way in her family. So she did have a Jewish heritage, probably. Uh, but for most of us, we don't. And so here we are. We're included because of God's grace and because of, of sending Jesus to be our Savior too. And so we who were once far off are now brought near and are included also in God's household and made part of the, His kingdom. Even more important though, it goes on, there's the healing of the young man in the next story. And you begin to ask yourself, what's so important about somebody not being able to speak or to hear? Well, one of the first things is he was supposed to be able to give praises to God, but if he can't speak, he can't praise God. And so when Jesus restores his hearing and his speech, now he's able to do that. He's able to praise God and give God thanks for everything that God has done. But there's something else that's kind of interesting and important. And if I had gotten all the lessons right, or if this were the day that all these lessons should be read and so on, We'd be reading Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 is a, a great chapter because it's about a bunch of prophecies that God gives finding their fulfillment when the Messiah comes. And one of the prophecies that's given that will happen when the Messiah comes is that the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And so when Jesus heals this young man who cannot hear and cannot speak, in a way it demonstrates that all these prophecies that relate to the end of time when the Messiah is supposed to come, they're filled in, fulfilled now in the presence of Jesus himself who is there in their midst. And so it's kind of an interesting little thing where you have to kind of take what you know from this part of the Bible and allow it to have some influence on what you know about this part of the Bible and you begin to see a connection and you begin to see how something fits together that you never before thought of, of fitting together. And so it becomes kind of something that's bigger than it first seems. It becomes an end time fulfillment of prophecies that God has made. Jesus came to bring a healing though that's greater than just allowing somebody who couldn't hear to hear somebody who couldn't speak to speak. He came to bring a healing that involves you and me and it involves our problem with sin and our position of, of people who are condemned by our own sins. 
I did some work not too many, well, a couple of years ago, actually, been using it a little more lately, using it for some Bible classes in different places, but it basically looks at some Old Testament roots for the Lord's Prayer. You know, just think about this. Would you agree Jesus was Jewish? Yes. Everybody nod yes. <laughs> good, good. All right. Would you agree that the disciples are Jewish? Yes. All right. What do you think the chances are with that when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, the words that Jesus gave them had some deep roots in the Old Testament? Would follow, wouldn't it? So I tried to take the concepts that are in the Lord's Prayer and see how are they treated in the Old Testament. And anyway, what becomes sort of interesting and now is, is uh, I forget which which word I was talking about and thinking about. <coughs> yeah, I did I took myself down a rabbit hole and now I got myself lost. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but Jesus healing sin and, and bringing us uh, out of that situation and so on. And there's a when you look at the old at the Lord's Prayer through the lens of the Old Testament, what you find is that that God takes uh, our our sin problem and He makes us whole. Um, also, even you look at the word I think I was aiming at the word trespass. The word trespass in the fifth petition really involves things that bring us condemnation. You know, you think trespass well. Okay, I stepped across the line, but I stepped back before you saw me. Okay, so no, no errors, no fouls, so on and so forth. But not necessarily so. Uh, you know, there's a story I remember, interesting thing, where the Soviets wanted to recruit this Russian to be an agent for them. And so without him knowing about it, that, that, that they were doing it. They put some extra bread on a tray that he was handling. And he thought, huh, extra bread, I'm gonna to have to account for this, so it's easier for me just to take it home. So he did. And same thing with a case of vodka. There was an extra bottle of vodka in the case. And what are you gonna do? I don't wanna go through the bureaucracy, bureaucracy of accounting for it, so he took it home. Years later, they came to him and said, we want you to be an agent for us, and he said, don't bother me, I'm, I'm not interested. They said, remember that bread? Remember that vodka? And it was all set up where they had uh, in mind to, to trap him, to make him work for them after all. But Jesus brings us a healing that's greater than anything that we could find anywhere else. And he offers that healing to us to be free of any sins that stand against us and to stand before him clean and without anything against us because he himself took it to the cross and he paid for it for us on the cross and now tells us that we're free and that we can go without that standing against us in any way. Amen.